Hello, and welcome to the Actualize Online presentations, um, capstone presentations. Uh, we're going to be going through a bunch of students who have taken this course, the Actualize Online Live course. Um, they're going to be demonstrating their capstone projects today. My name is Danny. I am the lead instructor for this cohort of graduates that you are about to see present. Um, I get to do the wonderful job of teaching people how to code and guiding them through this journey uh, for about 12 weeks. And they basically are extremely motivated. A lot of these students um, have come from other walks of life, have come from other careers, and they come to our program to basically learn how to code, how to change their careers, and how to change their lives. And so they dedicate a lot of time. They come to this class, they learn um, what a lot of people consider to be a very, very difficult material, and they build projects. And then they go off into the world and get jobs as web developers. Um, so you're about to see projects presented that are built from the ground up, um, meaning that these are built from scratch using the fundamentals of web development knowledge that they have learned in the past few months of being enrolled in this program. Uh, these students built their own backends, they built their own front ends, um, and they did everything all themselves. Uh, and basically, the way that they've done that is they've adopted a, a developer mentality. So one of the things about being a web developer is generally that it works differently than other careers in the way that you have to develop a developer mindset. And the developer mindset is learning how to teach yourself something new. So a lot of the students are going to present their projects today, and many of these projects actually have services and features that I didn't even teach them how to make. They went out and they taught themselves how to do that thing. They learned it and they implemented it in their own project, which is really, really amazing. Um, so before we get started with all of these presentations, I'm gonna go ahead and just introduce uh, Jay. And he's the CEO of Actualize. He founded this company um, from a single class in Actualize way, way back in the day, um, all the way to becoming a coast to coast boot camp that it is now um, across the US. So I'll introduce Jay and have him say just a few words real quick. So, Jay. Thank you, Danny. And it will just be a few words. Um, so, this is a really exciting day. Uh, this marks the graduation of the latest Actualize Online Life cohort. Um, all the graduates, who are presenting today, uh, they have really uh, demonstrated their growth mindset because most people uh, are really scared of code and most people, it doesn't even occur to them to think that they can learn this stuff. And they have taken it upon themselves to a really intense program to learn and become proficient in coding and build the projects that we're about to see. They've really given it their all and I'm really excited to see the presentations. Um, I just wanted to also Thank Danny for being the amazing lead instructor that she is. Um, she also really gives it her all and is extremely talented and an amazing and caring lead instructor. Um, also want to thank the TAs, Caitlin and Ben, for also helping out with this. Um, we all know that it takes the entire team to make this happen, so I'm really appreciative and grateful to all of you. Also want to thank the other panelists who are joining me today. Uh, we have, and they'll be introduced shortly. Um, but Trevor and Colleen, thank you very much for being here. Um, and that's about it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jay. And uh, yeah, I am gonna be introducing our panelists. We have a couple of panelists here who have joined us. Um, we're gonna be asking a couple of questions to our graduates as they present their projects. Um, so the first person that I'm going to introduce is Colleen. So Colleen, if you wanna just say a couple of quick words about yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen. Uh, I went to Jay's boot camp in the spring of 2015, so a few years ago, and I've been working as a software engineer ever since. Uh, I live in LA now, and I work for a company called Fair, uh, and basically what they do is flexible leasing of cars, and you do all the paperwork on your phone, and it's a, uh, I can attest to the changing your life aspect of this boot camp. Before this, I was in marketing, and I'm way happier now. So thank you for having me. I'm really excited to see the projects. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, Trevor. Hello everyone, my name is Trevor. I actually took the very first boot camp uh, five years ago now. I was part of that cohort. Um, it's been quite a journey since then. Uh, I got a job in uh, Chicago right afterwards. Um, about a year later, I decided, my wife and I decided to move to New York. So that's where I am now. I work with a company called 
VTS. Um, it stands for View This Space. It's a real estate, corporate real estate company. Um, and it's been a lot of fun, but haven't regretted my decision ever um, by going to Actualize and learning how to code. It's been amazing. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I didn't know you guys were both grads. It's so cool. Um, yeah, future future grads uh, right here. All right. So um, with all that being said, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started on our presentations. So the very first student that I have presenting for you today is the amazing Justin. So Justin, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? Take it away. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Justin. This is my website, GameQuest. Um, my website is designed to help suggest a video game you should play. Um, this idea came about when I inevitably get bored and I want to play a new video game. Um, but for those that have also experienced that, when you go to Steam or PlayStation or GameStop, wherever you buy your games, there's hundreds, if not thousands of games to choose from. And with so many options, it's pretty often hard to narrow that list down to the, just the one that you want to buy. So my overall goal was to just ask relevant questions about what games you like and to maybe give you just a small selection to choose from in hopes that you'll either just find a game that you want to play or it'll lead you in the right direction. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just for this demo's purpose, I'm already logged in, I've already created a user, and I'm also going to answer all the questions myself. It'll just help speed things up. Um, so a lot of these questions are very kind of broad questions to try to narrow down kind of a general focus that you wanna uh, play with. I'm just gonna select a few of these. Um, the way I've built it is that the more options you pick, obviously the, the bigger the net will be, and it'll give you a larger selection. If you only select maybe one option, it's gonna really narrow that focus down to specifically what category you want. So now that I've submitted the questions, all of these games are relevant to how I answered the, the questionnaire. Um, all these games are associated with each, each of those answers. Um, this is also just a, a view of the small selection out of, I believe it was 235 games that I managed to get in my database. They're all hard coded in. Um, so out of all those, here's the, just the relatively small selection. Um, and I can click on each one. So let's just say this game interests me. I can click on it and it's gonna bring me to kind of a display page of what this game is. It'll give me just a brief summary and it'll link a trailer in case I wanna watch it. And maybe the, you know, spark some interest. Um, but for just this demo's purpose, maybe this game, actually now that I've looked at it, it doesn't really interest me that much. Um, so I actually included all of the tags that are associated with this game. So maybe after doing this, I realize, you know what, I'm actually interested in horror games. And I want to look at all the different horror games that are listed. And then maybe one of them sticks out, like something like this game, Control. And after I do all that, um, I decide, you know what, I, I want to come back to this game. So I'm going to favorite it. After you've favorited it, you can actually go to your profile. Um, the profile, it's relatively basic, just to be able to edit all the information you have or delete it if you want, just some basic stuff. But here we can see all the games that I've favorited. Obviously these three were um, just examples that I already had set up, but down here we can see, <coughs> excuse me, um, the game that we just favorited. So either some of these games don't interest me anymore or I've already bought them and I can just clear them out, unfavorite them and just leave the ones that I uh, really want. Um, one of the last things is if I just want to look at all the games available, um, I go to this entire like catalog page 
have a few games that recently came out you can kind of look at just some carousel shots but overall um, it'll just literally just show you every single game that's in the database and I can click on each one like I showed you and you can favorite it and everything um, I was really passionate about this I do love playing games um, so it was good to kind of break it down and think about why I like games and try to explain that and build it into kind of a questionnaire form. Um, I also had to figure out how to link each game with each question. So I really had to kind of break each game down into different categories um, between like the genre, the theme, or how long the game took to complete. Um, questionnaire part was probably the most difficult part. Um, and trying to figure out how to build them all into like a big array and then use different selections to kind of filter out and pull from that large category to just give you the very specific ones um, you wanted to play. So uh, overall, that's my entire project. I appreciate you guys listening. Um, do you guys have any questions? Hey, Justin, I really like your project. This looks super great. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about uh, what specific technologies you're using for your back end and your front end implementations. So the back end is built uh, with Ruby on Rails. Uh, the front end is Vue.js. Um, for the theme, I used a bootstrap theme to kind of speed things up. Um, I originally was going to use an API. It was called Internet Game Database. It's very similar to internet movie database except for video games um, and I actually a lot of the information is sourced from there but I declined to use that because I kind of just wanted to make a smaller selection of curated games um, but overall everything else is kind of hard-coded and just built by hand that's cool um, if you had like did you have to knock any features off your list to get this done in time or do you have a wish list of what you would add to this project yeah, I, there's a lot of things that I feel like I could expand. Um, most of the stuff that I had to knock out uh, was a lot of user-related stuff. I originally wanted to include, like on the games page, like have features for the user to either rate it themselves or to maybe link like a Metacritic rating or reviews from like popular game sites. Um, I think there's more information I can show on these games page, like you know what year the game came out or just maybe more specific information. Um, and I think as far as the questionnaire, there could be more questions, there could be way more games. It can kind of just be built up even bigger. Cool. Uh, yeah, it looks really great. And then one more question. Um, you mentioned that it was like one of your most challenging parts was figuring out like the algorithm to pick which games fit with each category in your questionnaire. Um, over the course of the class, did you learn anything that would make that easier now? Or do you have a better idea of how you would implement that to make that a little easier on yourself? Yeah, no, now knowing how it was built and how I figured it out, I think I could easily improve that and kind of condense it. Um, a lot of it was like knowledge that I already had. It was just trying to figure out how to take all of those different pieces and kind of put it together to reach that conclusion. Um, it was, it is always interesting to figure things out like that. And it's kind of like a realization that I already knew this. It's just, I had to see it differently and figure out how to reach that goal. Totally. I can, I can relate. A lot of what we do is just taking our knowledge and translating it into code. So you did an awesome job. I'm really proud of you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Justin. And yeah, Justin did not uh, show his code today, but if you were to look at his code for <laughs> actually taking that algorithm of all of those games, all the parameters that he's collecting from that questionnaire, oh, here's a little bit of code. Um, yeah, there was a lot of complicated logic here. Kind of brute forced a solution. Um, there's probably a more eloquent solution that we could have got to, but uh, he did get to the solution. It works and it's awesome. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of complicated logic behind the scenes that actually went into figuring out how to take all of that data that a user gives and filter through all of the uh, tags to find the games you're interested in. 
So really good job on that. Um, all right, thank you so much, Justin. And we're gonna move on to our next presenter and we're gonna have Michelle present for us. So Michelle, please go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Okay. All right. Okay, hi, um, my name is Michelle. Um, and my project is a natural remedy site for uh, people who are interested in searching for natural remedies for certain everyday conditions like a headache, allergies. Um, this idea came about because I myself am really interested in health and wellness and things and I tend to lean towards the natural route when I'm treating certain conditions and I always found myself online um, looking up online like natural remedies for this or this or this and I always found myself on Yahoo Answers um, which is not the most reliable source so I decided to make a website where people can go and actually find um, natural remedies for everyday conditions so uh, so this is the home page here I basically just listed some examples of natural remedies uh, honey elderberry cinnamon um, and let's say you wanted to uh, log in. You would log in here. All right. And then let's say you wanted, you had uh, a product that you wanted to search for. Uh, let's say bee pollen or something like that. You heard of this from your friend and you want to know what it cures. So you can search right here and it takes you directly to the product show page where it has a description of the effects. Um, and then it also has the total number of votes and total number of downvotes. So with my website, you can also upvote and downvote a product, kind of like Reddit, um, as well as you can add comments. So let's say Bill really did not like bee pollen. He says, this stuff really made me break out in hives. I don't know. And comment that. But then maybe he tried another brand of it and he decided that he really liked it, so he can delete that comment. And then also on the product show page, you can see that it, you can see the conditions that it helps to treat. So bee pollen is good for the common cold or allergies. And here it clicks through to the product, to the condition show page. So this takes you and it describes um, the condition um, and it has a description here. And you can also see what you can treat it with. And you can also search in our search bar, not only products, but you can also search the conditions. So let's say you, you can search whether or not you had a product in mind or a certain condition in mind. And then let's say that you are a user and you posted all your remedies for certain things and you wanted to see um, all of them at once. So you go to the profile information page and you could see all of your products. In these, you can click through and see the product show page, as well as edit them. And here we have the edit form where you have the um, name and the overall nutrition, I mean the effects and the image URL, and um, uh, then the description. And then here, this is where some really complicated logic came in. You can add the tags of uh, the condition. So let's say, this, cert, this is good for allergies and the common cold. And you could just submit that and it takes you back to the show page. You can also delete on this page with this little trash can right here. And then um, let's say you wanted to make a new remedy. You can go over here and let's make, uh, here I have some things already prepared. Let's say eucalyptus oil. You tried this, you loved it, you want to share it with the world. Um, this is good for sinus issues. Okay, and the description. And then here you also have the tags. Um, let's say this is good for uh, the common cold and allergies as well. And that takes you to the show page where you can add comments, you could downvote it, downvote, add comments as well. 
Um, so with this website, that's pretty much it. Um, but with my website, I wanted to show you some of the code for the um, search bar. The search bar was actually a lot more complicated than it looks because not it doesn't just filter for, through things. It actually takes you directly to the product show page or the condition show page. So what I did for that was I used a V model on the input. Uh, uh, right here, V models. Mm. Um, anyway, we used a view model for the uh, input, and then I used dot find in order to find the uh, product within the products array, and then I got the ID of that product, and then I directed them directly to the show page. Um, I would say some issues that I had with this website in general was the theme. I had a really hard time implementing the theme because the theme I bought, um, every single page was pretty much the exact same layout so there wasn't much of a variety as well as uh it wasn't tabbed in correctly so the lineup of the code was not correctly formatted so it was really hard to work with um and i think that should, is it for my project thank you this looks really great michelle um, I actually am someone that would totally use this website. I'm a believer in the natural remedies and I'm having a crazy allergy attack as we speak. So <laughs> I would definitely be uh, using some of these suggestions. Um, so I was wondering if um, you used anything specific to handle your logging in and logging out functionality or did you do that yourself? Um, I just use uh, just this authentication where I use this uh, or in order to show it, so basically I use some current user logic in order to show when, let's say you're logged in, you don't want to see the login and the log, you don't want to see the login and sign up when you're logged in, you just want to see the log out. Uh, so what I did is I did some current user logic um, there. Uh, I can show you a little example of that. Um, uh, like right here, I used a function called is logged in. Is that something you wrote yourself? Yes, that is, oh, cool. well, that is something I wrote myself. That's awesome. Yeah. You're using JWTs, this is super impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I work on the uh, authentication service at my job, so I can totally, totally get down with some JWTs. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> it's cool. great. Um, so how did you do the tagging? That was really interesting to me. Uh, well, that took actually a long time. I spent a long time uh, talking with, um, uh, Danny about that. It was definitely a process, but um, basically what I ended up doing was, um, where's an example of this, um, was basically, it was this, honestly, the logic was, here it is, V model tag and then tags. Um, it just auto-completed filter. I, it's, I can't, it's hard to describe, um, but the gist was, um, we used a function, this uh, autocomplete, and then we filtered through it, um, and then we did it to lowercase and found the index of the tag. to look. It's a, uh, if you can see the code right here, it's kind of complicated to describe, but. Super cool. Yeah. And then last, last question, what was your favorite part about building this website? Um, honestly, the upvoting was kind of difficult for me to do, um, and I had a really hard time figuring out the logic for that, but in the end, I finally got it to work. And uh, so that was definitely my favorite part because it was big, a big challenge, I think. Cool. Yeah, it looks awesome. Good job, congrats. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Michelle. And uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember having this conversation with my students at one point about Colleen says JWTs and some people, I say JOT. Is that just a me thing, Colleen, or is that an everyone thing? <laughs> no, that's an everyone thing. Okay. I don't know. It's like GIF and JIF. I don't know. Which don't one know. is right? <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, yeah, so just so you guys know, not everybody calls it JOT, so don't blame me when you say JOT and someone looks at you funny. They'll know. They'll know. Yeah, I knew what she meant when she said JWT. It's an acronym. Um, all right, thank you so much, Michelle. So we're going to go ahead and pass it on to Michael. Uh, Michael, go ahead and present your project. Oh, 
Hello, my name is Michael Burrell and I'm a student at Actualize and I'd like to just start off by giving a shout out to Danny and the TAs and the other students who helped me get through this process and worked around my schedule with the power outages and stuff. So the name of my app is Rate My City and I decided to make this app because in 2017 myself and my family were displaced due to the wildfires in California and we needed to relocate. And like most families, we didn't really have a plan B, so we didn't really know where to start. So my first idea was to go to the internet and try to find some cities that might have high reviews. But when I did that, it was really hard to find the information that I was looking for. Most of the information would be on like a blog that seemed very like biased or that was like a bad experience that someone might have. And I was looking more for like overall data and stuff like that. So um, I created this, map, my, this app to hopefully fill that gap that I was looking for. There weren't any websites like Yelp, but for an overall city. And one of the things that was really valuable to me when looking for a city were talking to people that actually lived in the city because I felt like they just had a much better overall picture. So my app is a database of reviews from people that live in their said city. So I'll show you that some of the features on the app now. So this is the home page, and one of the things that you might see here is the top rated city. That would be the thing that I would personally be looking for. And that was an important part to me, and I'll show you some of the code that went into that. So one of the things that I learned in this class was to start slow and build my build up from there. So the first step I did here was just get an average rating of all the attributes in my reviews. Then in the next area, you can see that I built upon that code by getting the average of the averages. And then I used the same logic to get more averages below that. And here finally is where I decided to display that code. And one of the issues that I had with working with this was because I decided to put the code in my index view <coughs> and I used the max by method, it turned my index, view, index into an object inside of an, with an array inside of it instead of just being an object. So when I tried to log that data on the front end, sometimes it wasn't pulling up correctly. And console log was the key to having checking my data every time. So um, let's go down here and Maybe you heard that a city like Santa Rosa is really nice. So you can type in the search bar here and see the review for it. And you can see some user descriptions here. And if you scroll up, you can see an overall rating for this city and some overall attributes. So um, now I'm going to show you a user profile. So this is my current city and where I live. And if I go to the user info, I can change that. And if I move, I can change that here to a different city. And I'll save that. And you'll see that my review hasn't changed because even if I move, I still have a firsthand account of living somewhere. So I felt like the review would still be really important. So now I'm going to log out and create a new user. And I'll have him live in Santa Rosa. And you'll see that it comes to the sign up or the login. And he will log in and he can go to his profile and see that he doesn't have a review yet. So if he clicks here, it'll bring him to his city that he lives in and he can create a review. So let's just say he really loves the place he lived in or that he lives in. And now you'll see that his review has been updated. And if you go back to the city, the city averages have all been updated with his information. And you can see his description here. And if you go back to the home page, oh, you'll see that the top rated city hasn't changed because Dallas just has great reviews, I guess. And um, yeah, so some features that I would like to add to this would be um, an, an API that might have more interesting data on, on the cities it might show like events or local activities that are happening. And 
because all my reviews are in numbers, it's uh, easier to have interesting model methods here, like most popular. There's all sorts of things that you could add to that list. And um, another thing that I would like to add at some point would be more user data that might give context for the reviews, such as like an age of the person or when they made the review at the first time. And another thing that I really wanted to add was a map box feature that might show the relative location of the cities to other places. So um, I guess in closing, I just wanted to make this app to help people find cities if they need to relocate or even just to visit. And that's my presentation, thanks. I love this project, Michael. Um, I'm sorry to hear that you were displaced by the fires. I know that's an issue for a ton of families, so it's really cool that you're taking initiative on helping people out. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, why you did, like what are you using on your front end here? Is it also Vue.js? Yeah, it's Vue.js. Can you tell me a little bit about why you're doing the like calculations that you're doing for all the like average ratings and everything, why you're doing that um, in the Ruby end of things instead of on the JavaScript side? Was there any well, reason you did that? I just felt like, um, Doing it in the back end and kind of making the website like a database was a good way because then it's easier to pull the data to the front end. And if I wanted to use more model methods, like maybe for some reason, if for some reason someone wants to know the worst city, that would be pretty easy to make. Totally. Makes total sense. That's super cool. Um, and then I noticed a lot of your data is like linked to other things like you have users that make reviews Can you tell me a little bit about your database and how you got all of that to connect together? Well, that was one of the hard parts is having associations because some of my partials were Arrays inside of objects and then other ones were just objects So I used console log to just make sure I was always pulling the right data through Cool. Is that your favorite debugging tool right now? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah print statements are the best <laughs> Um, awesome. And then what was your favorite part about building this? My favorite part of building it was just thinking logically, like, what would I want to see if I was going to a website? So that's why one of the biggest features here is like, as soon as you go to the main page, you can see a top rated city. And that's awesome. Yeah, you did a good job of like putting yourself in the user's shoes and giving them features that are important. So good job. Really great Thank project. You. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, our next presenter today, uh, our fourth presenter, is going to be Eddie. So Eddie, please go ahead and share your screen. Let's uh, get it going. Hi, my name is Eddie. Um, I created an app for powerlifters. Um, the reason why I made a, an app for powerlifters is because uh, there's actually a lot of fitness apps and uh, just a lot of general workout apps, but there's not one really meant for powerlifters. And what we do is um, we, we like to track our one rep maxes. And um, basically that's like the maximum amount of weight that you can push or pull in an exercise. And the main three exercises for that is a bench, squat, and deadlift. And for the for like the powerlifting meets, those are the three uh, exercises that you normally would do. And so just to get started with uh, this website, um, we have a register page, which will let you uh, sign up. Um, but for our purposes, I'm going to log in to an existing user. And this will take us to the list of our workouts that, um, that I've made. Uh, but just to start off, we're going to start with the exercises list. And here you'll see a list of all the uh, exercises that um, the user would input. Um, basically, it'll be the name, the sets, the reps, and the weight in pounds. And if you do click on one of these exercises, it'll take you to the individual exercise where you can edit it. And it'll let you change the uh, number of sets, the number of reps, or the weight that you want. And uh, here you'll also be able to delete it or add. 
And so um, you just, same way as you update or uh, create, you just submit it. And once the exercises are all in place, um, I already have a set data here, um, you wanna go into the workouts. And the reason for that, uh, you'll know shortly, but when you first go to your workout list, um, you'll create the name of your workout. Um, in this case, I have four, which is bench squat, OHP, which is an overhead press, and a deadlift. Um, you can input the date when you want to do the workout or when you actually create it, it's up to you. Um, it'll show the category as far as whether it's an upper body workout, a lower body workout, or a full body workout. And then here I inputted an option to put in a note. Um, for me personally, um, I wanted to input notes in here just to give myself like tips and cues for when I actually do the main lift. In this case, would be the bench squat and the lift workouts. Um, believe it or not, like when you do a power, when you're a power lifter, like and you do a bench, you you normally think that a bench is a chest workout, but in powerlifting, you can actually make it a full body workout and use your legs to actually do a bench workout, which is kind of weird, uh, but it is possible. Uh, but here, if you actually do click on the bench uh, workout, it'll take you to the show page, and um, you'll see the previous information from from the page before right here. Uh, but below, you'll actually see all the exercises associated with the workout, and that'll and this is all information from the previous exercises index. Now, if you want to actually edit this portion of the workout, like the the date, the category, or the uh, the note, you can just click here down below, and it'll let you uh, edit that information. And when you actually create a workout, this is where you'll be able to add all the associated exercises that you created from before. And so um, you can just create a new bench workout, um, set a date for that. Let's say I'm going to create a new bench workout for today. Uh, this is going to be an upper body workout. And then the same note from before, I'll just leave that blank for now. And here I can just add a few of these exercises um, just for uh, my bench workout that I'm making today. And then if we click on it, we'll see the associated checkboxes that we marked off will show up in this, or in this workout. And for now, I'm just going to have that deleted and it's gone. And next, we'll have our profile. And here, uh, this is a picture of myself, I'm huge. And uh, I'll have my bio here, which will tell me, tell the user um, or whoever's viewing this page a little bit about, about myself, some miscellaneous info, uh, the email that we use to log in, phone number, and we'll be able to update that all here. If we go back to the page, and scroll a little bit down. Um, this is the main uh, functionality that I'd, I'd want to introduce to a uh, user, which is the graphing portion. This is what's actually going to keep track of uh, a user's one rep max. And here we'll have our bench, squat, and deadlift numbers. Um, and when you hover over it, it'll show this little box showing what the numbers are exactly, uh, in case you can't really tell based on where the bar ends. And also, uh, if you look a little bit down here, you'll be able to input uh, actual numbers to update the graph. And so let's say I just do 200 for all, click on that, and it actually updates on the graph on the page. And so um, one thing that I'd actually want to implement uh, in the future regarding this graph is um, the ability for the graph to actually um, like pull an estimate. So from these exercises, I already have a few of the main workouts, which is the bench, squat, deadlift. I'd want the graph to be able to take these numbers in particular and pop out an estimate onto this graph based on what those numbers are, uh, perhaps like a percentage of that. Uh, that's something in the future that I'd want to implement for that. And uh, that's basically how my uh, app is working. And that's all I've got. All right, I'll throw it over to Trevor to ask a question or two. Cool, my turn. I had a nice, uh, nice project. I like it. I have to say, Zoom takes off a few pounds. Um, so, anyways. <laughs> uh, let's 
see. I have some questions for you. It looks good. Um, first question, what programming concept were you struggling with during the course that this capstone helped you, um, that helped you make, uh, make sense of it? Like what made it click for you? Was there anything in particular that your capstone was just like, oh, now I understand what Danny was trying to teach me. <laughs> yeah, actually, so it's funny because we all have, or we all learn this concept of a two week lag time where um, we won't like completely understand a concept or get to under, or get to be comfortable with it until two weeks after. And so since like making the theme was one of the last things we learned, uh, that's one of the things that actually like started to really click for me during the process of making this project. Cause it was like towards the end and that's the thing that I was working with the most. Okay. Or that's what I found myself use, uh, spending the most time on actually. Was the theme? Yeah, it was definitely uh, the theme, the bootstrap theme and the implementation of it. Um, we'll get a little technical here. Can you kind of walk me through how you associated workouts and exercises? What is that? What do those tables look like in associations? Yeah, um, well, actually, I need to get my back end up. Um, one second. Yeah, so these are how the associations look like. Um, and even through um, using the front end code um, in the, uh, I'm sorry, one sec. Yeah, so uh, these are the associations that I created in the models. And so, um, yeah, so the workouts would have have many workout exercises, or they would have many exercises through the workout exercises model. And uh, that's basically the logic that was used to actually um, get this page to work. Uh, this workout show page. And then in the actual front end, uh, where is this? There it is, yeah. Right here. Uh, this is the logic that was, or the syntax and the code that was used to actually get the exercises to show up in the workout show page. So <clears throat> when you built out your associations, I know that's a concept that's really hard to understand and really hard to grasp when you're first learning it. Did you find implementing it this way, <clears throat> sorry, help you um, understand it more? Did anything stand out to you during that process? Yeah, because when I actually did try to make these associations, I was struggling really hard with it. Um, I spent a lot of time with Dan trying to figure out um, how exactly this worked. But after spending like a few hours on this, um, that's when I actually like started to get like how it actually like comes together and how I'm actually able to pull the data into the front end. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I, I enjoy working on the, the back end side of things with data in particular. Um, so last question, I want to be cognizant of time. Last question, the graph side of things, you mentioned there was another step you wanted to do. Um, was it a was it a time issue, or were there certain complications associated with that that would prevent you from being able to move forward? Yeah, it was mainly a time issue, um, and so I spent way too long trying to get the themes to to work and get set up, and so um, I just wanted to make sure that I finished the themes. But by the time I did complete that, um, I found myself not really having enough time to work on the graph. So that's definitely something I'm going to be working on afterwards. Cool. What uh, graphing library did you use? Uh, I used high charts. High charts, yeah. You said, how did you find um, reading through technical documentation? Um, 
I mean, I did a lot of Googling, obviously, but like when I was trying to learn how to actually implement the high charts, I, I did that also took me a really long time to figure out how to do. Um, but after just going through it, um, I feel pretty comfortable with adding these, this type of information into a website. So I've got that going for me. Yeah, I, I found when I was first learning to code, and even now, that one of the hardest things of programming is trying to wade through people's technical documentation. And so if there's one recommendation I can give to you is, uh, is to get better at that, because it is a learned skill, actually, um, understanding how a piece of technology works. Um, and so if, yeah, there's one thing, if you want to work on, if something you want to work on next after this is uh, getting better at those technical docs, it'll make it easier for you. Um, implementing future technology. Mm -hmm. That's all I have for you. Good job. This looks good. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Eddie. Um, and that picture just absolutely slays me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, I was laughing at, at all the jokes uh, silently with my microphone muted. Uh, all right. So our very next presenter is going to be Jackie. So Jackie, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and show us what you built. Okay, so um, my, hello, I'm Jackie, and the app that I created is called the Eat Together app. And this app kind of came about due to some personal experience um, as a university student and also when I was at work, when I'd want to go grab lunch with coworkers or with friends, sometimes it was a little difficult to find someone to go quickly grab lunch with. And so I created this app um, that allows foodies like myself to be able to find the perfect eating companion based on their location, schedule, and preferences that the user inputs so that they don't have to eat alone. Um, and so this is the homepage right here. Um, it just has like really simple graphics here. Um, we can click on the sign up page, and the sign up page allows a user to input their personal information um, that is kind of needed in order for. Um, so for the user to be able to pair up with another user in the database. And so I'm going to log in as one of my users that I have already. Already, His name's Eric. There we go. All right, so this is Eric, and this is his craving survey um, that it takes you to. And so we have Eric, his profile picture is right there. Um, and this is a survey that we have each of the users fill out every time that they want to go out and eat. Um, and so this survey shows a category, um, the pricing that they're willing to pay for a meal, and then, of course, their available date and time. And so before I fill out the survey, I kind of want to show a bit of the back end that I have. Um, so this back end was all Ruby code and we're doing Ruby on Rails. Um, and here I have a action, the create action within my cravings controller. Um, and so how we have this is that in order for two users to be paired within the database, I had to create a self-join table, um, which was a little confusing at first, but it allows that we can have two different users in the database be able to match with each other. Um, and so with this cravings create action, what we have is the user's input, um, the parameters that they want um, in regards to what they're craving for that day. And once a craving is saved, we have a match method. And so this match method is done here in the cravings model. And here the match method shows um, query that we've done where a craving, um, if it has the same category, appointment, and of course, it doesn't have the same craving ID or user ID, um, then a match can be made. We also have over here um, pricing. And so with pricing, how we have it is um, whether a user has, is within one dollar sign range of each other, then they can still match if the other query um, that we have beforehand, uh, is, if that if statement is met beforehand. And so we will go back and fill out this survey for Eric and see if he's going to have a match today. So Eric is craving Indian food. Um, he wants to pay anywhere between 11 and 30 bucks. 
Um, let's say he's going to be going out on Monday and his lunch break is always at noon. And then we're going to have him submit his craving form and it takes him to his cravings library. Looks like he's had a few cravings in the past few days, but here we have his craving here for Indian food um, and the price, the available date, available time, and when it was last updated. And so one of the neat features with um, the whole method is that um, once Eric has created this craving, we'll see if a booking has been made. And it looks like a booking was not made. And so we're going to try a different craving this time. So we're gonna have Eric add a new craving. So let's do Korean food this time. It looks like he wants it to still be the price between 11 and $30. And let's do Monday again, but this time let's also do it at noon because that's when he has his lunch break. And let's submit. And it looks like a craving was made for Korean food. And one of the neat features of this app is that over here in my cravings controller, I have here a Twilio API. And so Twilio API allows users to be able to receive text messages um, once a booking has been created. And so over here, um, I did receive a text message because I'm pretending I'm Eric, that shows that he has a booking made for Monday at a Korean restaurant. Um, and so we're going to go over here to his bookings show page and it shows that there's a Korean booking. You can click on the details and it shows the name of the restaurant. It has a cool map that you can zoom in and out of to show where it's located. And it also shows the name of his eating partner, her profile picture and her contact info. Um, and all of this information is grabbed off of the Yelp API that I have here and my backend and my cravings controller that's shown here. And that is the basics of the Eat Together app. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, sorry, I was just uh, writing a couple of things down. Um, this is awesome. I can attest uh, that at my work, we sometimes spend 15 to 20 minutes trying to figure out where we should go eat um, and who wants what. So it'd be awesome actually if you could create like an organization in this and have all your employees be part of that organization and then you can put in your craving and get matched with someone from work who's also craving that thing. So this is, this is nice. Um, questions. So what did you, what did you learn while building your capstone that you uh, maybe wouldn't have otherwise learned? Um, I think for me, I implemented three different APIs. Like I said, I had the Twilio API, Yelp API, and then I also used um, Here Technologies Mapping and Geocoding API. And so a lot of it was just going through documentation and understanding how to put in these APIs. Out of the three, the only most straightforward one was probably the Twilio API, um, which was really interesting because I thought it'd be more confusing to understand because it seems pretty neat that you can just have, uh, you know, with the push of a button, you can have a text being sent to a personal phone number. Um, and so I think for me, I really had to kind of understand documentation and also understand, well, sometimes since the documentation can't quite fit with the code that I have, I have to learn how to parse through data sets um, and how to understand what can be applied within my um, code that I have and what may not need to be in there, but the documentation says it might be a thing that should be in there. Yeah, that's really related to my next question, which was, you know, what's the, what was the hardest part of working uh, with these APIs? Yeah, so like, yeah, right, I said before, it definitely was probably, um, I know with the map API that we used and even the Yelp API, those required a lot of parsing to be done because with the Yelp API, it gives you so much information about restaurants, um, whether it's location, uh, reviews, um, and there's probably like 10 different categories for just one restaurant in general. And so I had to kind of, at least for this model, really narrow it down, which required a lot of parsing through arrays and objects 
And so that was probably the more cumbersome, tiring aspect of dealing with APIs. Did you enjoy working with them though? I loved it. I think it's amazing that you can just kind of slip in um, an API and have, you know, your code that you have be able to access so much data um, through other type of APIs that are out there. And I would love to implement more APIs, I think, in the future. Um, I know that, um, I, for me at least, I'd love to maybe do like a Twitter API where it can do like Twitter feeds about like restaurants that are popular and hopping in the area um, and whatnot. And so I would definitely probably implement more in the near future. Yeah, I, with my caps, or, yeah, with my caps, so when I, used a couple APIs and it was probably the most enjoyable part for me. It was fun getting that data and sifting through that data and it just felt really powerful to be able to do all that stuff. So that's cool. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about maybe doing more work with APIs. Is there something else in particular that you'd like to do next with your project? Definitely. So another thing that I was thinking about, um, if this is going to be outside of just a work environment and it's more for just public use in general, I probably want to add some kind of features to allow people to be able to um, select maybe the gender or the age group or even implement some kind of social media feature where they only match with people who they have mutual friends with so that they're not just being selected with a random person um, and they don't know much about their background and whatnot. Um, and so I felt like that would be kind of a fun feature to add in there so that people can, you know, kind of be more picky about who they want to go out and eat with. Yeah. Cool. And I may have missed this. Do you only get one eating partner or can you be matched with several people? For now, you can only get one eating partner, but I can definitely down the line implement and have multiple eating partners and kind of do like a group eat out session. So that would be a great idea, actually. Cool. Well, that is all I have. Great job. This looks really good. And I like it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, apparently I'm Veronica because I got a message that I have a booking. <laughs> um, yes, we tested out that Twilio API. It did work. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Christy. So Christy, why don't you go ahead and turn on that screen share? Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Christy. The app that I designed helps people find new recipes based on food that they already have in their house. Um, I came up with this idea talking to friends about it, people that like love to cook or don't really know how or any kind of person and people basically buy so much food and then they don't know what to make so they just kind of end up wasting it. Um, what's nice about this app is you log what you have so it's different than just using a search engine. If you just log on like, oh, I want to make something with chicken, it just shows everything. But now you can go in the next day and be like, oh, I know I have chicken. So it's nicer than just a search engine because it holds what you put in. Um, so this is the homepage. From here, you can create an account right there, or we're just going to log in. Okay, so this is my profile from here. I would edit my information or just go and look at my ingredients, which is what we're gonna do. Um, I have it set up so you can add your, do everything right on this page. Um, you can add your ingredients, which it's really just what it is and when it expires, it's not very complicated. You can sort what you have based on the name and it does that. It's by default, it's set up as to when it expires. So we kind of use everything first but you can also sort alphabetically. We can go back to expired. Um, so say I just went to the store and I just bought some salmon. So I'm gonna put it into my app and it expires Monday. So there it is, right there. Um, so the, how this functions is I'm actually using a third party API. What you can do is select different ingredients and like this, All right, look. and when you press this button, this is my recipes controller and it's basically pulling up ingredients, uh, recipes based on the ingredients that you just chose. So we're gonna take a look at the code. 
Um, as you check the ingredients, the app is putting that, it becomes an array. This is turning into a string, which is sending it to the API because that's just, that's how it takes in the search. Um, and then it generates 10 recipes from their API. And from here you would um, look at all the recipes. Maybe this one looks good. Oh, just kidding. It's exactly what we did not want to happen. So this is your recipe. It takes you to the outside website, it opens in a new window so you don't lose your page. Um, the API takes up to three ingredients, but you don't have to. You can just use one or two if you want to. Um, like we can just do broccoli. Um, <laughs> uh, everything is just, you modify it right here. So if I just want to delete it, I can do it like that and it's all gone. Um, problems I had doing this was choosing an API. I thought I found a really great API, which I did because it was free and, um, the data was really easy to read and use. Um, but later on down the line, we found when we selected everything and we went to the recipes index, this is the image from the API and it only gives it that thumbnail size, which we didn't realize afterwards. So we kind of had to modify our plans to make it work in the app as just a small image. Um, going further, I would like to choose like an image to have, um, like if the API doesn't give an image, like we would just source an image just to make it look nice if it's not available. Um, another problem with the API was certain ingredients had to be spelled or typed a certain way. Like we have it making everything down case because if you put like an, uh, the first letter capitalized, it didn't like it sometimes. Um, certain things like onion, you can't write onions, just random things like that. So next time I would definitely do a little bit more research on the API, um, try and be a little bit more picky about it. Um, something else I learned was working with the theme. Um, you really have to take time to like, get to know each theme because they're all different and somebody else wrote this code for you. Um, the issue I really had was certain buttons just would not work anymore once I put it into the theme. So we had to go back and do some troubleshooting and figure out why, but it, you know, it was just a random tag was enclosed or they had a lot of HTML forms in their theme, which the buttons didn't really agree with. Um, something I would like to implement with this app is maybe when you log in, it would take your ingredients that are going to expire sooner and like put them in, an, in a separate box over here. So remind you. Um, another idea I had was um, it would like send a notification to you if things were about to expire. Um, but it's pretty simple in that way. But I think it's useful because it holds your information for you. and. it opens you up to new things. But I guess that's all I have. Cool, this is awesome because uh, my wife is really into using up all the ingredients in our house. So <laughs> it would be something we could use. And then the other problem is like, what do you do with that ingredient? You know, you have it, but who knows what to actually use it for. So uh, this is a really great idea. Um, questions I have for you. Uh, so what, what problems happened while you were making this that you did not foresee? As, as developers, we always make plans and, and uh, try to foresee all the events, but we never do. So was there anything in particular that, that you came across that um, slowed you up a little bit? Um, what, I, what I mentioned about the certain functions that just did not work once we put into the theme, I mean, it seems obvious now, but I was genuinely surprised because you'd work on this code and you get it to work magically. And then you think, okay, that's done. I don't have to worry about it anymore. But once you put it into the theme, if it's not done perfectly, it's not in the exact right spot, it just doesn't work, you know? So it kind of feels like you're going back to the drawing board in some ways, but I think it's just, it's just the nature of the beast, you know, when you use a theme, someone else's code. <laughs> and yeah, this may be along the same answer, but what did, what did you enjoy least about um, working on the capstone or programming in general. What did I like least about working on this project? For me, I found I got the most work done if I could sit down and work for several hours at a time. But if I got up and I would get distracted and like an hour would go by and come back, it would be harder. 
So I would say the least enjoyable thing was scheduling time for myself to actually work on it and know that I could be productive. I mean, that's more of a me thing than a programming thing. But I actually found I enjoyed it more as I was working on it because I like to learn by doing. So to actually create an app and see it work and like, I don't know, it was really gratifying. It was really like, um, I don't know, it was just kind of nice. It's like, we all, you know, we've spent so many months together learning all this stuff and now we're actually using it and it's working, you know? Yeah, for me, if I had to add to that, it would be definitely front-end stuff. CSS, oh, yeah. JavaScript is what I like least about. <laughs> Yeah. programming in general so I, I try to stick to the to the back end which is a, another question I have for you actually is like do you, do you enjoy working on the back end or the front end more and and why is that I think at first I would have said I like front end more because I feel like I like doing something and seeing it change right away um, but once I finished my back end part for this product particularly I felt really accomplished I was like wow that's actually really fun um, I actually really like both I guess is what I mean but back end is a bit more straightforward. Front end, you kind of have more freedom, but that also makes more issues potentially. Um, I let the front end of this product, the pictures are really beautiful. So that was kind of fun to find different things. So maybe front end. Yeah. Would be my answer. Cool. Um, so I asked this uh, question before, but uh, to someone else, but what uh is there like a programming concept you were struggling with that the capstone helped uh gel for you some honestly using some of the vue.js we would go through it sometimes like we would go through the lecture and i would listen to it like okay that makes sense and when i would go and implement it and it didn't work so that was kind of frustrating but using it in the project definitely um helped cement it more in my brain seeing you know different things like vbind and v4 and how they're different and how you can kind of combine things um yeah that's definitely something i feel better at now because of the project so view cool well awesome this is a nice job uh nice talking to you as well that's all Thank i have all right thank you very much christy and uh thank you for making me hungry <laughs> <laughs> by staring at your beautiful photos <laughs> um all right so my next presenter is going to be angel all right let's see if i can get zoom to cooperate just take me a second having some trouble getting the share button to show up And there it goes. Okay, I'm live. Hi, my name is Angel, and my app is called Rate My DM. And what brought this about was I have a son who loves Dungeons and Dragons, and he decided about nine months ago to become a dungeon master. And I watched him spend hours putting together a campaign, drawing the maps, painting his miniatures, getting everything ready. And he posted the campaign and nobody signed up because he was not known in the community as a DM. He's played a lot, but he didn't really have a reputation. And I thought, how can I help him let people know what a great DM he is? Because I knew how much time he spent putting into it. So I decided for my app to develop something called Rate My DM, which is similar to Rate My Teacher. And the way I have this set up is it's really a resource for dungeon masters to come and post upcoming campaigns. And then after the campaign is over to request that the people playing with them, leave them a review. So they get feedback and then they can also keep record of some of the campaigns that they've done. So right now I'm logged in as Jackson. He is a DM who is actually running a campaign tomorrow. And he can go on the homepage and see other DMs in his area. You can sort by name, you can sort by the rating and see how you rank if you want to, you can sort by location. But right now as a DM, I'm logged in and Jackson can go in and see the last three campaigns that he's run. And he can also see the campaign that he has set up. And going forward, a future, implement, uh, future improvement that I would put in there would be to let users favorite DMs so that they can get notification of an upcoming campaign and maybe get a text because there are really only six, maybe seven slots in a campaign. And probably if you're really popular, it's hard to get in. 
And so that's something I definitely wish that I had thought about doing. Because Jackson is logged in as a DM, he has the ability to edit his campaigns or even delete them, but he does not have the ability to leave himself a rating. So right now he has no ratings. But if I were to go back and look at one of his prior events, you can see that he's had three people leave him reviews. He's great overall DM, he knows his campaigns. And this is a way for him to see, you know, what kind of, should I spend more time on my storytelling? Did I spend enough prep time? That kind of thing. So right now, he could also use this as a resource to see what's being played in the area and see, oh look, Call from the Deep has been played three times. I know Austin, next time I see him, I'm gonna check in with him, see what it is I can do to maybe help me with my next campaign. I can see, looks like he has uh, really good reviews in terms of enthusiasm. And so it's a way for them to maybe talk to each other because it's kind of like a history of their events. So let me ch log out as Jackson and log in as a user to see what they would be able to see. Oops. I think I mistyped that. Here we go. So here's Corey. Now the DM could email a link directly to the campaign that they just ran, or Corey can say, oh, I know I'm playing with Jackson. And oh, look, he's done these three campaigns. When I see him tomorrow, I'm gonna to say, hey, are you ever gonna run unusual opposition again? But after, so say it's tomorrow night, he can come in to stop at the gate and he can actually create a rating because he's not the DM. And he can say, you know what, overall it was fantastic. The enthusiasm was there, mm, the storytelling, and I can also leave some notes if I want to. And then he could submit. And the user can edit or delete their own ratings, but they can't edit or delete anybody else's ratings. And individual users cannot create campaigns, but they can see them. So I spent a lot of time making sure that when you create an account, and I'll show you this part, you won't actually create one. Really the key question on creating a new account is whether or not you are a DM, because that drives whether or not, what aspects of the site that you can see. And so, um, I it was, was really keen on keeping my MVP um, as clean as possible because I knew that front end work was not my strength and I wanted to give myself enough time to work on the, um, the theme and make sure everything was working. And I'm really not that great with a blank page. So now that I see how it looks, I can think of all these things that I wish I had done or things that I want to improve and add on in terms of being able to favorite people and get notifications and add on to these things. But I, knowing people who play D&D, &D, I didn't really want to spend too much time adding a whole lot of features and functionality because I think they just really want to go in and use the, this for what it is, which is basically a way of saying, hey, I'm coming into the area, um, I'm gonna want to play D&D, &D. this guy looks like, you know, they look like they have a good record, they've got a thing coming up, it's something that they can arrange. So it's something that I'm kind of hoping my son will use. Um, he's a teenager, I don't know how excited he gets about things, but. It was something that I enjoyed working on for him, and it was nice to be able to bond with him on that. So that's my app. Awesome, Angel. That's fantastic. Has your son seen it yet? He has. I don't know how impressed he is. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to impress teenage children. Yeah, you said it's so cool. I hear. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is a fantastic app. So does it, I know I see there's like, zip code stuff going on there. Is that currently actually tracking location? Uh, well, I can sort by location because I didn't want to, um, I just didn't want to have to go through the process of figuring out how people would spell their cities and things like that. So that's something that I would probably tweak going forward in terms of, and then I thought about doing mapping and that's just one of the other improvements that I want to do. The other thing I thought about doing was putting in links for how to sign up for the campaign because those usually those are done through maybe a meetup or something like that. And that would be a feature that I would add for the DM to be able to add that link onto their site so that people could sign up if they see it, since there are only so many slots you can do. And you know, you're going to be spending four hours with these people. You want to make sure it's somebody that you would, you would have a good time with. For sure. I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot of really great functionality here. What would you say is the most complex behind the scenes? Um, the most complex for me was making sure that certain things, for example, like when you're not, when you're not logged in, going into a campaign, I noticed the other day that you could leave a rating. So I had to change the logic so that you had to be logged in to, before you could see that button. And so just keeping track of 
who's left this rating and so you see this right now you can't delete or edit a rating because I didn't I'm not logged in as a user and I didn't leave it and I didn't want the DMs to be able to leave their own rating so just figuring out the logic of who's logged in what access they have to which site that was probably the most challenging part for me and um, I want to give a shout out to Benjamin for all his help and patience with me on that <laughs> it's all authorization stuff yes. which, yeah it certainly can be complex mm -hmm. um, awesome what's the um, What's next on the list for features? Next on the list is as a user, I think it would be really great for you to be able to go see the campaigns that you had attended. And I didn't really think about that until a couple days ago. And it's one of those things where now I'm starting to see, once I see how it's come, come together, now all of a sudden I have all these great ideas. But when it was a big, huge project, I had a lot of trouble figuring out all the different features and functionality. And I had to see it in, per in action before I could come up with some of these brilliant ideas at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, this is an awesome project. and. Whether or not your son is impressed, uh, I certainly am. So really nice job with this. I had a great time. Awesome, thank you so much, Angel, yeah. Angel spent a lot of time uh, working on this project inside and outside of class, and I think it came together really well. She has so much conditional logic. Like, it's not like different pages. It's like depending on the page that you're looking at, who you're logged in as, you see totally different things if you're logged in as a regular user versus the DM, if you've already left a rating or if you haven't. So there's a lot of conditional logic that's happening here that doesn't like seem immediately apparent, but it's in there and it's, and it's totally functional. So awesome job, Angel. Um, our next presenter is going to be, as soon as I pull up my list, will be Tori. Tori, please go ahead and share your screen, present your awesome project. Okay, hey everybody. My name is Victoria Kabadi. Uh, people call me Torita, and this is my app, uh, Knowledge Nuggets, or uh, Nugget for short. Um, the motivation for my application was mainly based on my own experiences. Um, I have a little bit about my background as I spent the last six years um, working for myself as an entrepreneur, and then I also put myself through college for six years part time. And it was through that experience um, in both the community college and in university I was exposed to very drastically different teaching styles, class expectations, testing styles. And I'm not talking about like tiny differences. I mean like drastically different. For instance, one of my harder classes, the professor began on day one, not with a syllabus, but asking people to raise their hand if it was their second or third time through the course telling us he expected all, if not most of us to fail, which was very nerve wracking <laughs> and frustrating. So this app was essentially um, derived from that experience. and. Um, it's basically what it does is it connects um, students who've taken a course with their peers who are going to take the same course so they can trade resources, whether that's used books, um, class notes, recorded lectures. I used to record some lectures with my iPad or, um, you know, audio lectures only or, you know, just to sit down and actually talk um, from student to student about class. So to show rather than tell. Um, this is my landing page. Um, I opted for this little logo nugget guy for my home button. So you can click that and it welcomes you to Knowledge Nuggets, helping students navigate college through clear expectations of their courses. Um, the student will uh, then hit colleges, which will take you down to start by finding your school and you can choose which university you are currently attending. So we're going to University of Las Vegas. And this will take you to a list of courses that are listed for the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. And here you can scroll down and you can see a ton of different, you know, um, courses, which would be hard to parse through. So added a handy little search bar, which means I can type in, you know, say 101. I'm looking for all the basic 101 classes that are offered and have listings or, you know, um, I can search by a subject like accounting or, you know, magic or something, which don't ask me why that's a subject in my school that I have right now. Um, now, uh, if you want to actually interact with this and we want to uh, like say we're looking at, okay, how many people have posted for introduction to film? We can then go to a page that shows the introduction to film class with the class number associated. Um, you can search by used books, midterms, or lectures, or post your own nugget. And then you can also scroll down and see these are the um, cards or the list right now of all the current offerings from other students. And it has like their username, a little button, what data was posted, and are they 
you know, posting that they have knowledge nuggets available books. Like this was just the shorthand version. And if you want to see in more details, you can click more details and you can see the entire like offering that they have right now. Like this class introduction to film has EV supplies that you had to purchase and stuff like that. Now, if we want to contact that person, we could, there's a contact button right here. However, we're first going to need to log in. So we will log in as, um, I apologize, I'm testing my update action and I need to check it back. <laughs> um, as a current user. So here's my current user for the moment. Um, this is Apachai, and this is his profile page, which also has a list of all the po um, postings he's listed so far, all his knowledge nuggets. Um, under his profile page, if he decides, oh, I don't want to have this profile page anymore, I want to change my name, email, password, or, you know, maybe opt to a newer picture because that one's, uh, you know, not the best one and it's sideways. I added a handy uh, choose file feature where you can actually, you know, pick a younger picture or he was cuter and submit that. And now that's in the profile page. <laughs> so also going through the process, um, if you go here and you find a class where you want to contact somebody who has specialty equipment that you're going to need um, and actually Yeah, and um, you can go right here and you can contact them. And here we could post a message and we have another user who's also logged in too. And I can type that I want to buy your equipment. And it gets sent over and we have our little messaging system right here. And if we go to our other user who is right here and has their list of messages, you can also see they have messages that are here they can choose from each user and the, the last message that they received is shown right here. And you can actually go to the here and you can have a back and forth of your messaging system happen. Um, I also have another handy feature too, if you've like exhausted what you're looking for resources wise and you wanna just see campus updates that are happening, I um, use the Twitter API to bring in a live feed of Twitter uh, updates that are coming from your school with whatever they're posting. Um, and also, if we want to post our own nugget um, really quickly, we would go to find a class that we've already taken, um, say we've taken advanced criminal law or whatever, we'd go post a nugget. And here we would say which professor we had, um, we would add a whole bunch of details. We could add, we have a use bug, we could have midterms, and we can create a post. And it will now pop up under our profile under posts that we have. And um, if you did notice in the last page, um, that page showed our post page. It's very similar to the show page of like if you are looking to actually take a nugget from somebody, but um, instead of the uh, contact me, it has an edit button and a little modal that pops up. So that is here so you can update or destroy a post that you've already created. And that is a very quick run through of a lot of stuff that I need in my app. Really nice job, Victoria. Thank um, you. I love the branded like nuggets with the KN nuggets. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a lot of different features here I'm trying to think where to dig in so the data all the all the data about the courses is all user generated right it's all the nuggets that people post um, well kind of so all of these um, are actually I ideally don't want anybody to just be creating courses because there might be misspellings or stuff like that like ideally I would like to have these seeded from a back-end like database that actually has like you you can go online and you could see all the courses offered at a, like at a university I would like that to be permanently seeded but all of these, like which professor it is and what like what people are doing, I would like these posts to be the individual user input. So, I see. So currently, are the courses coming from an API, or currently it is like I couldn't find one, unfortunately, for and the universities that I was working, I was looking at. So. So you're saying in the future it would be pulled from somewhere, so it's like the authoritative uh, data set. 
Absolutely, yeah. I think that would be really nice. So, and it would be less room for error if people misspelled something or whatever. Right, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a lot of different, so all these different, um, like, sub features, like specialty equipment and those things, are those, like, attributes of the offering? Are they other database tables? How does that all work? Um, so for this, uh, the main offerings are just books, class notes, midterms, quizzes, finals. And then I made a recorded lectures, audio recorded lectures, video, but I kind of figured I didn't know like what else people might have. So there's specialty equipment and that's why it's a um, field where you can type literally anything. So if it's like an AV class or if it's like, you know, a pottery class that has specialty equipment or who knows what. And then I even gave like an optional like six bars right here for like input of you can put whatever you want to offer as your nugget. So it's um, kind of open that way because I figured there's a lot of classes and I can't anticipate what all those needs are going to be. So I tried to leave it general, but give like options to be specific. Yeah. So these, I see where you have like the books checkbox and the details and those like two different <laughs> attributes in the database. It's, it's like a books Boolean and a books details kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're, they're all, um, well, so it's actually a join table of a join table. Like, so these are all the books, the class notes, the midterms and the quizzes and all of that. Those are part of the resources. And then they have the post resources, which connects all of them. So it's a, uh, it's joined together on multiple levels. So the details can each be connected from string to resources. And that's why you have one that's optional and editable and you can add anything to, but you also have the hard coded books, classes, and midterms. And that actually was a hard bit of logic to kind of figure out how to put those together. <laughs> I was gonna say, that sounds, yeah, yeah. It sounds really <laughs> complex. And there's a, it's a, a lot more complex data configuration going on under the hood from, from what you could just tell here. So yeah, that's really, yeah. Danny helped me with the advanced dev partials and that helped a lot, but it was, it was a, it was a little bit, it was very rewarding though to work on and actually get it together. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's the fact that it has all that under the hood and, you know, it just comes out pretty seamless in the, in the front end of this app, but, you know, is a uh, really impressive. Thank you. Um, no, this is a fantastic app. Congrats, Victoria. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Tori. And uh, yeah, when you think about a traditional join table between two things, um, you usually think the join is, you know, it's joining the post and joining the resources in the post resources. And Tori actually stored an additional attribute on the join table itself to store those details. So her join table was actually more complicated, which is why all that was uh, actually pretty difficult to implement. And I, uh, yeah, I was really proud and impressed that she was able to do all that. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Tori. Our next presenter is going to be Todd. So Todd, please share your screen and show us what you built. All right. Hi, I'm Todd and I created a app called Looking for Group. The purpose of Looking for Group is going to have local tabletop players uh, be able to find local groups uh, or not local if they're using an online platform to play um, so they can find groups for other players to start a group with or also find out um, popular games uh, around them or other groups are playing around them. So right here we're going to have the login and they're going to be, I'm going to use a uh, already established user. So we're going to sign in right here and the front page is going to be, uh, you're going to be able to choose what do you want to see? So the three options are going to be uh, players, which is going to be just a single player who um, has an account. You're going to be able to find a party, or you can also look at games. So the first one we're going to look up is players. So we're going to have a players index here. And what that's going to show is local players that are signed up for the web app. And we're also going to be able to sort through them based off their name and also distance. And what the distance is, is I'll actually pull up my back end. Um, no, my back end is not there. Thankfully. Uh, right here. So I'm using a uh, Jam Geocoder, which what it does is takes the current user's um, zip code, and after the user is authenticated, it then geocodes uh, that zip code, which puts a longitude and latitude associated um, to that user. And then from there, in my view, um, it will create a, a distance from all the users based off of the current user's zip code, the longitude and latitude. 
So he's going to be able to look at, or she is going to be able to look at all the local users and they're going to be able to click on one. And then they're going to get a basic information about that user. And then they're also going to be able to see um, groups they're in. And then if they like any games, uh, Danny does not like any games. So uh, the user might be looking for somebody who does like games. So we're going to go to Will. It looks like Will has uh, a few groups that he's in and also a, a few games that they follow. From there, you could choose to look at groups. And with the group index, we're going to be able to sort by the name, the distance, and members. So the, uh, the original user who creates a group is going to also um, set where the uh, group is located at. So we're going to be able to sort by distance. And you can see that there's quite a lot of groups right by. There's also groups um, close and far. So we're going to go to the Weekend at Bernie's D&D group. Uh, they play d and at Bernie's house. So this group, uh, this current user is not currently in. So you can see the users in the group, and those users in the group are who decided to join up, and also you can see um, the games they play. It looks like they play Dungeons & Dragons. So from there, the user can say, hey, this looks like a cool group. It's really close to me. I'm going to join it. So now they can join the group, and everyone else can see that they're in the group, and they're added um, to uh, that group. You can also leave the group as well or edit it. Once you join the group, you can then edit the group and the editing group can basically let you change the group's name, description, etc. And you can also choose the, uh, the game. So maybe they're tired of Dungeons and Dragons and they want to play uh, Pathfinder. So they can then update the game. And now you play Pathfinder. You can also look at uh, games. So we have a whole list of games. You can sort by player count. So you can see which games are most popular for the website. Um, and also by title. So here we go, we're on the Pathfinder page. It looks like my current user does follow a game, which she can follow or unfollow. Uh, it gives you a brief description, and you can also see the groups that play the games, and also the uh, players that play the games. So if my player does wanna create a game, or create a group, uh, he doesn't see anything that he interests him. Uh, he's gonna scroll up, he's gonna hit create a group, and then from there, he can uh, choose all the items that fit a group, and he can also pick the game, and that will create the group with him as the original member, and then other players can then join that group. Um, and we can go to My Account, and on the account, uh, we can edit the account if we are signed in as this user. If not, it will say a message user, a little, a little information, and then we can see all the current groups and games that my user is signed into. From there, um, I'll move over, and I'm gonna sign in as another user. And we're gonna go to my account. And we can see that this person doesn't have any um, groups or anything. It looks like they're probably brand new. So what we can do is go to groups. And then we're gonna look for a group that's nearby. And we're gonna see that Todd is in it. And maybe I'm gonna message Todd. Actually, up here. And I'm gonna create a conversation. And then. Their users can message each other, which is instant messaging, and they're able to then uh, create um, a connection. There's a lot of stuff I didn't hit in my feet in my um, my MVP um, locations. I'd like to have groups have locations so you can see where the group actually is located at um, in terms of uh, actual physical locations, so a card store, um, somebody's house. Um, I'd also like to have groups have events. Um, so you can see like, hey, we're having, you know, this location's having multiple D&D events. Um, and then also I'd like to create groups to be more of a, right now they're more of a community and not a group. I'd like to have um, actually like membership approval and then groups also have campaigns which would really go well with um, Angels, Capstone. But uh, that's basically my project. Thank you. This is a fantastic uh, Capstone project, Todd. Really, really impressive. A lot of, it also seems pretty, 
data heavy users groups games a lot going on there my sure. schema is insane i can actually <laughs> that up. i actually have that like set up just because i wanted to um show it was very danielle was like a massive help it was uh oh wow yeah um, let me see yeah it was about double the size of this when i when i started doing it by myself and then um Danielle was able to be like, nope, 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 until I was able to kind of get down to a point where like this seems actually feasible. Um, it was like double yeah. the size at least, so it was impressive. I see a lot. Of, this is very organized. Lots of uh, a lot of joint table action here. Um, yes. Yeah, really cool. Um, in terms of the uh, instant messaging, is that like an action cable? Yes. Thing? So I'm that, using action cable. Was that easy, difficult, somewhere in the middle to implement? Um. I would put it somewhere in the middle. I still don't quite understand it completely, but um, I was able to get it work working with uh, a lot of uh, bugs and kinks with a little bit of help from Danielle. That's very cool. Um, I noticed on the very front page you had a login through Facebook. Is that is that working yet? So that is not. That's something I kind of decided halfway through I wanted to eventually be able to do, and that was part yeah. of my view theme. So I was like, you know, I'm going to leave it there. So every time I see it, I'll be disappointed in myself. And then I can like actually edit it so it works. Yeah, no, I, I figured it may not be working if you didn't demo it. But uh, yeah, definitely a cool future feature. Um, with the, uh, you know, when you sort by distance, yes, does that does GeoCoder do that, or do you have to sort of have GeoCoder check the distance for each one and then you sort it? Like, how does that work? So GeoCoder uh, has a as a um a function called um, distance from, which is what I use. So GeoCoder basically takes the zip code after the user is authenticated, and then we'll put in a longitude latitude for that user um, in the schema. Uh, so then, then you have can, to like uh, check that against each. Yes. So um, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. So in my view uh, for index and actually uh, my show, I have it right here. So it actually checks the distance from the current user. So it actually works against the current user. So it'll check the distance from, um, so the index will show uh, how far everybody is from that current user who signed in. So it'll only work when there's a uh, current user. Uh -huh. And then you sort by that distance. Yep. Very cool. This is super impressive. Um, Thank you. Really nice job, Todd. Thank you. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah. There was a lot of cool logic that went into this that we looked at together. And uh, the GeoCoder gem just had this really cool functionality to be able to sort or to be able to find the distance from one thing to another thing. So here he's rendering the user's index and essentially uh, taking in the current user's information, so whoever is logged in, and saying, all right, show me all of the other users and also show me how far they are from this current user. Um, so there's a lot of cool logic that's happening here. And uh, this is actually pretty much the correct way to do it. Um, cool, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, our next and final presenter for today is gonna be Benji. So Benji, please share your project with us. All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, so this is my app, Showmate. I'm just gonna take this out real quick. All right, this is my app, Showmate. And the reason I made this app, so what it does is it allows you to add friends and then send movie and show recommendations to those friends. And the reason I made it is because I love watching movies, love watching shows, and uh, I'm always talking about them with my friends and friends are always coming up to me uh, asking me what they should watch next because they know they, that I watch a lot. The problem with that is I'm the kind of person that texts you back five hours later, so never available in the moment. Uh, so with this, you always have a list that is readily available to you. So I'm going to walk through this app as two users actually. First user is already avid fan already using it and that's going to be benji the other person is going to be benji's friend danny so benji's going to tell danny hey danny you should you should get this app so 
Dana's going to come here and be greeted with the home page, but of course she doesn't have an account. So she's going to sign up for one and she's going to put some information to make a, to make an account real quick. And once she types in her information, she's going to be redirected to a login page where she can then actually log into her account. Once she logs in, first thing she sees is a pretty barren homepage. Uh, and there's a message saying you can add some friends so you can get some recommendations. So she can head over to the friends page. And once she gets Benji's username, she can opt to send a, a friend request to Benji. And once she sends it, as you can see, it says friend request sent. So then the next time Benji logs into his account, uh, his homepage actually filled with features sent by a bunch of people. Like we have Angels and Demons by Morgana, Olaf's Frozen Adventure by Ash, and the list goes on. Uh, so he can head over to his friend's page where under friend requests, sure enough, there is a friend request by Danimals. So he can accept it. And now... Danny and Benji are officially friends. At this point, Benji can head over to the search page and search for some uh, features to send to Danny. So first off, got to send over Aristocats. So I'll send that over. Secondly, the classic, every time, Casablanca, everyone needs to see that movie. And finally... Uh, he actually knows Danny has seen Frozen, but she has not seen Olaf's Frozen Adventure. So we'll send that over too. And so the next time Danny ever has a moment to sit down and just take some time to watch something, she can log into her account. And as you can see, her homepage is now filled with uh, these features recommended by Bendy. Although she actually has already seen Olaf's Frozen Adventure, so she can remove that from the list by simply clicking on the movie poster. And there it goes, and her list is now updated. So there's a walkthrough of my app. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about some of the features. The first one, of course, is the friends feature. This was very difficult. I'm, I'm very glad to have it in my, in my app, but it took a lot of time to figure out the methods to sort of differentiate users by senders and receivers. This also uh, needed to differentiate friends by pending friends. So you can't actually interact with other people unless that connection is mutual, which is of course very nice. Uh, the second feature I'd like to talk about is the search feature. So I search for any movie. This actually uses uh, a third-party API, which I'm going to open up real quick. It's called OMDP API, and this calls information from IMDB. There is a set number of calls, though, that's, that are free, and you can, of course, pay for more. But the really cool thing about my app is that once a feature is recommended to somebody that's never been recommended before, that feature actually gets saved and put into my own database. So after that first time, the next time anyone else sends it to anyone, uh, it's not going to make an API call. It's simply going to pull that data from my database, which is uh, going to save me on a lot of calls. Um, although I'm very glad to have both of these features, they were both coincidentally the most difficult features to add. And they took hours and hours, and I had a lot of help from my teacher and my TA, so I'm very grateful to them. Uh, as far as my... My future of this app, something that I would love to include later is as it stands right now, you can send and receive friend requests or send and receive features that show up on your, on your homepage. But I think it would be an awesome idea to have two lists, one of things that you've received, but a list that you can actually create yourself. You can add your own features and basically create your own watch list uh, for yourself that of things that you might have seen around that you'd like to, to, to watch at some point. So that is 
my app, Showmate, and thank you for your time. <laughs> this is awesome, Benji, and I will definitely take your recommendation to watch the Aristocats. That sounds <laughs> riveting. Um, so the look and feel of this is really cool. Did you make that logo? Where did the, where does, where did the logo come from? It's all so slick. Oh, I actually made this logo, which I'm very happy about because it reminds me of a, sh a thing called Scott Pilgrim, but I'll knock it. <laughs> so you're a designer? You have a design background? Yes, I, I do enjoy designing. I was actually almost had my foot in the door uh, going through a design course instead of a coding course. But I don't know, something led me to do coding instead. And I'm, I'm very glad for that because I told you. like, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it looks like you may not need the design course. This is uh, really, really slick looking. Um, so with regard to the um, feature, which is really cool, of, of storing the data from the API in your database, so every, how does that work exactly? Every time someone make a, makes a suggestion, do you like first check to see whether it's in the database? And then if it's not there, then you go to the API? That is exactly what it does. Uh, it checks using the, the, the parameters from the actual third-party API. And if that parameter matches something in the database, uh, it gets created. And if it does match, then it just pulls it from the database. Yeah, that's really smart. What are the restrictions of the API? How many calls does it let you, let you make on the free tier? For free, I can get a thousand, but I think if you pay just like ten dollars or something, it's it goes up to ten or fifteen thousand or something. So, yeah, no, that's really that's a really uh, smart feature, um, and and that's something to think, you know, as you progress and a lot of a lot of optimizations in web development involve like caching and saving stuff and not having to do repeated API calls. So it's a really good um, skill to to delve into. Um, this is just, yeah, all around, it's a really great app, a great idea, and really well executed. Nice job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Benji. Um, and yes, your project does look fantastic. And also, <clears throat> your project basically, oh, we're on the screen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start my screen share. Um, yeah, your project has so many cool features, and Benji's doing a lot of really, really cool data parsing. Uh, that you don't necessarily see right on the front end, but that is actually happening under the hood. There's a lot of really cool data parsing that he's doing to get all those friendship things to show up the way that they are. Um, and also thank you for the League of Legends references, Benji. I appreciate all of them. Uh, yeah, all right, so thank you guys again so much. I wanna thank all of my amazing students for presenting and pretty much graduating. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank all of my amazing presenters. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, and of course, thank you, Jay, for joining us and for asking some questions uh, to my students. Uh, really amazing job. Well done. Honestly, you guys put in so much effort. I was there with you along the way. I was there with you during a few of those long nights um, spent outside of class coding and getting those final things in. So you guys all deserve this victory. You deserve this celebration. Um, and you all built something. You all built something from the ground up. And guess what? You started learning how to code, what, maybe four months ago with the pre-work is when the pre-work began. Uh, that's where you began. And now here you are having a full stack application that you built, you came up with the idea for, you designed the schema for, you built the back end, you built the front end. And honestly, um, I'm impressed every time. So well done. Congratulations to everyone. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna end our uh, screencast right now. So. We'll see ya. Let's see if I can stop it.